up. Stimmen aus Südasien. Speak up. Voices from South Asia. Today I want to have a conversation with Sri Lata Batliwala about intergenerational feminisms. Sri Lata is director of the unit Knowledge Building and Feminist Leadership at CREA, Creating Resources for Empowerment in Action, a feminist human rights organization based in New Delhi. Earlier, she worked as scholar associate at AVID, Association for Women's Rights in Development and International Feminist Network. Being an active feminist grandmother, she attempts to be an older leader in the feminist movement, supporting, mentoring, and learning from younger feminist leaders and new feminist movements. Sri Lata, let, uh, let us start uh, with the question, what is your understanding of feminism? You are Uh, you call yourself a feminist grandmother, so uh, you are since some time already in feminism. And what is your basic understanding of feminism? So I define feminism and understand feminism as having three aspects. It is an ideology a set of beliefs about how the world should be and how human relations should be. Two, it is an analytical approach. It's a way of looking at social realities that's completely different and distinct from any other ideology. And third, it is a social change strategy that is very unique. Uh, because feminism is not simply about a set of beliefs or a way of analyzing the problems of society. It is a way of changing. It's a way of intervening and creating change that's very distinct. So I'm first a little bit puzzled that in your definition of feminism, gender doesn't uh, come up at all. Absolutely. I don't find it a useful term. Uh, in fact, I find it has become an extremely problematic term because gender is often used to uh, disguise or not speak about power. It's dis used to disguise and not speak about patriarchy, which is one of the fundamental power structures of society. Of course, in, if you were attending one of my training sessions for young activists, when I talk about feminism and, as an ideology, I unpack that. And there I do talk about the ideology that believes that there is a central power structure in human society called patriarchy. And feminism's goal is to dismantle patriarchy in all its forms but also it understands that patriarchy doesn't operate alone. It operates through multiple other power structures. And so it seeks the transformation of all these power structures through which patriarchy operates. So I unpack it much more, but I have had many people say to me, it is interesting how you only use the term gender once. And that is when I'm talking about feminism as an analytical approach, where I say that it is the feminist analysis and feminist theory that first articulated or took the concept of gender out of the field of say botany and biology and used it to signify the way identities are constructed and that the way in those days and old days of feminism, you know, the male and female, the masculine and feminine. And today we talk about, of course, multiple gender identities. So that is usually the only context in which I use the term gender. Mm -hmm. 
I know that you worked a lot in international contexts, international networks. Uh, but now I would like you to ask what is specific, is, is there any specific Indian or South Asian in your understanding of feminism? Or can you add something to this very general understanding of feminism and patriarchy? Uh, what is specific Indian or South Asian? Yes, I think uh, one interesting thing about feminism in South Asia is that long before the term intersectional and intersectionality became popular, I think South Asian feminists have always had a very intersectional approach because we lived in a region of the world which has the possibly the world's most sophisticated form of social exclusion and power and privilege, which is the caste system. And we also saw how uh, minorities, uh, people of oppressed castes, uh, we saw the differences between Uh, you know, how gender operated, how gender relations or gender power operated in, say, rural areas and urban areas. So we've always had a very intersectional approach. We didn't call it that, but it was always intersectional. And I think this is one of the unique contributions of South Asian feminism is our understanding from a very early stage that patriarchy does not operate alone and that it operates uh, alongside all these other uh, structures and systems of power. I think another unique contribution um, that South Asian feminism has made is um, the, the wide range of grassroots movements and grassroots struggles Uh, that were very deeply rooted in a very feminist understanding and a very feminist approach. So you'll find movements of both poor, rural, marginalized, rural and urban women um, that have a very strongly feminist uh, approach and analysis. For instance, the entire movement of uh, uh, women living in informal settlements in the cities, in slums, on you know pavement slums, and so on. They don't call themselves feminist, but when you look at their strategies, when you look at their analysis, you take very basic things, like the redesigning of housing, when government offers them alternative housing, that women led the process of redesign. So I think there's a very unique way garment workers, uh, rural women, agricultural workers, Dalit women's movements, uh, movements and struggles for food, for land rights. All of these are many, many of them are deeply feministic in their approach. And I think I'll stop there. Those are two very, I think, distinct things. Yeah. Thank you for this explanation. You contributed uh, a lot to the concept of empowerment. What role did this concept play in the 1980s and the following years for feminism in India? And which role does it play today? See, I think... In the early days when we began to embrace the concept of empowerment, it was a very critical concept because for two reasons. One is that it helped us to really shift the discourse and the perspective and the approach from what was at, at that time largely charity-oriented, welfare-oriented, rescue rehabilitation, and of course, the famous women in development type of approach, and focus on power. It gave us a way to really put power at the center 
of the kind of transformation process we wanted to be engaged in and helped us understand uh, patriarchy as a power structure, not as a cultural system, but as a power structure that operates through the economy, through social norms, you know, through culture, religion, and multiple other, you know, uh, sites. And I think the second way in which the concept was very critical at the time is that many people were also coming out of left movements into the feminist movements. They were, they were bringing, you know, the very uh, sort of Marxist analysis with them. But also it helped us to engage uh, with the Frarian ideas of consentization. Because the Frarian approach, and then what we called feminist popular education, because the Frarian approach was called popular education, and the concept of empowerment helped us to frame and undertake a feminist popular education approach in a very uh, powerful way by saying, we are not here to give people things. We are not here to hand out, you know, welfare, give people a loan, give people a sewing machine, you know, give um, health care, give a literacy class. We are here to make a space and time for the most marginalized women to reimagine and imagine what kind of change they want to make, starting from where they are. So it was empowerment of those who were most marginalized. Today, yeah. I think we've moved much beyond it because today we talk about, uh, we've learned a lot. Uh, we've realized the way in which many empowerment processes excluded, for example, other identities, uh, LBT women, uh, sex workers, many other you know, highly marginalized groups, and we were able to uh, take on the concept, to go from the concept of empowerment to feminist social transformation, which is that this is not just a project for women. This is about actually transforming the whole of society. So we moved from women's empowerment to feminist transformation. Ah, yes, this, but this is a very important point. Can you just explain a little bit more about the concept of feminist social transformation? I think it is uh, the fact that uh, feminists and feminist movements and fem the feminist imagination embraced the idea that we could actually define a concept of social justice that was distinct and deeply different from the prevailing concepts of social justice. And the way I like to explain this is, we've had many ideologies of equality and social justice, yeah? You have, you know, Marxism and Gandhianism, many other socialism. But I think what feminist uh, social transformation did, the concept did is, all these other ideologies, they stopped at the door of the household. And they felt equality at that level was enough. Feminism opened the door. It went inside. It saw how power operates in the most private and intimate spaces. And it said, this is not okay. So feminist social transformation goes deeper and further by, I think, uh, what I really like to do is to use the concept of deep democracy. It is a transformation that's based on democratizing all the spaces in which we live our lives, not just in public policy, not just in law, not just at the household level, but at the level of every individual having the same opportunities, the same rights, the same access. So I think uh, the concept is that feminists have a vision of social transformation that is based on a very deep form of democracy and the deepest form of social justice. 
Yeah. You, another topic you covered over the decades was uh, movement building, social movement building. If you now compare the, let me call it old feminist movement in India and the new ones, what are the main differences? Well, I think there's been a radical shift uh, at many levels. In South Asia, for instance, in the 70s and 80s, there were a lot of schisms uh, within, uh, among feminists. Huh? There were the socialist feminists, there were the radical feminists, there were the Gandhian feminists, etc., etc. And there was actually quite a lot of tension and, you know, sense of um, conflict almost between these different uh, segments uh, of the movement. All that has disappeared. You know, it's become almost irrelevant. Two, I think uh, in, in the early days of the modern feminist movement, I'll say modern because say in my state of Karnataka where I live, we had a feminist movement in the 12th century, okay? So we've had feminist uprisings are very ancient in this part of the world, unlike in Europe. But here in this modern phase, let's say from the 60s, 70s onwards, I think another big shift was the focus on the state. Uh, that so much of our activism was focusing on uh, changing state policies, changing, you know, legal reform and things like that. And rightly so, because we felt that the state had a very critical role to play in uh, achieving these kind of changes that we were seeking, particularly in terms of uh, rights to land, access to resources, employment, education, healthcare, etc. But I think what a huge shift that I've seen now is that younger generations of feminists have a much more, I think, sophisticated and complex understanding. They understand how the role of the state has shrunk, how the state has increasingly withdrawn as a catalyst for social change. If anything, in many of our countries, it has become totally aligned with very oppressive uh, and sometimes very fundamentalist forces. So younger women's move uh, in, the, uh, in, the, in the feminist movement, younger feminists, because of course we have a lot of uh, non-gender conforming people also in the movement. We have a lot of young men uh, are focusing much more now, I think, on how do you actually tackle the social structures that uphold patriarchy and how do you transform them? Mm. And they, many of these are so creative. Uh, you know, they use all the best of social media, of, you know, creative forms of theater, of music, of performance uh, to kind of really reach out to people. Uh, you have interesting uh, framings like the right to loiter. You know this word loiter, you know, just hang around in a public place without any particular reason or agenda. Men do it all the time. So we have this wonderful organization founded actually in Bangalore called Blank Noise. They have a campaign called I Never Ask For It. And they've collected the clothes women were wearing when they were sexually harassed in public places. And they make exhibitions of this. And they hold these exhibitions in public areas, on streets, and invite passers-by to conversations. You know, so there's immense creativity. They have a deeper understanding, I think, of all the hidden sites and forms that patriarchy takes. Uh, they focused on things like the freedom of movement, and of course, uh, on the control of sexuality, which, you know, we were very far behind in beyond looking at contraception and the right to determine whether you bear children or not. They've gone way beyond that. 
I think they've got a much deeper understanding of the right to construct our identities in more fluid ways. Finally, I think the most remarkable shift, I would say, and really a challenge brought about by younger feminists that I greatly support and respect is to look at the use and abuse of power within feminist spaces and to actually hold ourselves, uh, hold a mirror up to ourselves to, to say we are sites of power, we are actors and participants in power structures, and we are also abusers of power. So I think the challenges to how power is used and abused in feminist organizations, in movements, so the whole thing that pushed me to do the concept paper on feminist leadership really came from there. So I've seen huge shifts, certainly in South Asia, but also worldwide. Thank you very much, Srilata, uh, for sharing uh, your uh, positions and giving us these insights. Uh, thank you. All the best to you. Speak Up, eine Produktion des Redaktionsnetzwerks Südasien. Speak Up, a production by the Editorial Network South Asia.